to return to the point I was making before about you know uh, how were these big platforms transported the uh, mundane and common uh, answer by archaeologists is the wooden roller theory. Everything was done with wooden rollers. Let me remind you, we're at 14,000 feet, which is above the natural tree line. No, gr no trees grow at 14,000 feet. They never did. So they never had any wooden rollers. And this is a big plateau where if they would have imported wooden rollers, it would have been a way, it would have been, you know, at least 800 miles to import those wooden rollers. And uh, there is no record of it, not even in the oral traditions, that anything like this ever happened. And like I said, uh, you know, archaeology's answers are pretty mundane, but sometimes mundane does not make sense. So, here we are in, in Egypt, and uh, here, the, the flying barges is a very uh, mo uh, incredible motif all over Egypt. By the way, you have the same thing in Native American petroglyphs, where you have this half uh, a shield or a, a wave like this, or, or a crescent moon, I should say, and um, with a person inside, and the legends behind these heavenly, uh, uh, behind these ships, is that these were the heavenly barges with which the gods, you know, arrived and left back to the kingdom of the gods in outer space. And in ancient American myth, you have the exact same thing, where uh, you have a crescent form and an arrow underneath it. And in any in Native American petroglyph, anything that has an arrow to it, in most of the cases, and archaeologists actually agree on this one, it, sig it signifies flight, very fast flight. So if you have this crescent-shaped form with a person standing or sitting in it, and underneath, an, and underneath it you have an arrow, that means that this thing was flying. And also in ancient American uh, in Native American myth, mythology, we have references to flying shields. We have references to uh, these flying pumpkin halves. So we're going to get more into it later. This here is a uh, monolithic site. I mean, sorry, a megalithic site at the Osirion in Egypt. And it's absolutely massive. This doorway, a person would come to about here. So just look at the difference in size of these blocks right here. Now, notice the construction up, up here with the smaller stones and the massive megalithic stones at the bottom. <coughs> The stones that were used down here, or the, or the, the construction down here, that is the original construction. Everything else that is above came later. Uh, which construction is more sophisticated? The more ancient one. Down here, I will give everyone 10 bucks if you can put a dollar bill in between the fittings right here. It's impossible. And there was no mortar used. So this is absolute perfection in masonry. And by the way, similar stone walls can be found in South America, in Peru, and all, also on Easter Island. So, I mean, it's absolutely fascinating how this was done. And this Osirion, by the way, has access points, and this was just recently discovered that it's a shaft that goes straight down. And we've made a diagram. And there's actually three stories with a sarcophagus that's underwater right now. Sarcophagus, by the way, is empty. And from here to here, we're talking about 40 yards. So it is deep, deep, deep in the bedrock. There's also a hall that has been discovered. This is not the Hall of Records. 
that's allegedly underneath the Sphinx. This is something else that has been discovered. This here is a, uh, a capstone that is different from the surrounding stones or the, the, the surrounding bedrock and the access point to this chamber is smaller, picture this, is smaller than the capstone. <laughs> Physically, that is impossible because you can't get a stone in there from a different quarry through an entrance that's smaller than the actual capstone. So, you know, I, I don't even want to, you know, hypothesize. Because, to be honest with you, anything will sound ridiculous. So I'm not even going to go there. I'm just showing the evidence that it exists. By the way, this here is the Wall of Crows, also in Egypt. So here is a person. There is more of these stones as big as, little, you know, railway cars. This is one of a sarcophagus that was found at the Serapium in Saqqara. This here is a person. I mean, let this picture sink in. Again, the access points to these chambers are smaller than this whole thing. Something does not make sense. And here is the physical evidence. Now, what is it? Technology. This was not done with, uh, in my opinion, with mind control. I mean, this had to do, you know, someone has the technology to literally move this stuff or beam it in or whatever. But in my firm opinion, it, it is something that has something to do with technology. Oh, here we are, Native American myth. <clears throat> Anywhere you go, and like I said, I just returned from Arizona. Any souvenir shop you go to, you have these dolls that you can buy. They're called kachinas. And the kachinas are often referred to as the all-knowing ones. Or, if you ask the elders, the, sh the shamans in Native, in Native American tribes, they're also referred to as the star people. So everywhere you have, in Native American myth, you have these legends and myths of these kachinas that a long, long time ago descended from the sky and literally created mankind. So according to Native American myth, there were four worlds. The first world, there was absolutely nothing. And then the creator world, I mean the creator God arrived and uh, he started to create the beings for the first world, which were all, you know, insect looking like creatures. And then he says, eh, this is pretty boring. So he created the second world and the third world and each time the creatures were improved. And on the fourth, in the fourth world, he created us. I mean, this is all myth and mythology legends. I am not saying that that's how it was. What I'm saying is that we should look at this from a modern day perspective and ask, what is it that these ancient legends and myths are trying to tell us? Because whenever these kachinas arrive, they're also responsible for teaching us in all sorts of uh, you know, courses or, or artifacts. Here's another one. I mean, they all look very, you know, space age like, like astronauts that our ancestors encountered and they didn't quite understand what was going on. And uh, according to Native American myth, this planet was seeded by these star people. I mean, am I to argue with them? No, because again, what we have here is living mythology. We also have living mythology in South America, in Brazil, in the Amazon. This is the Cayapo tribe. And every year, sorry, every five years, they have a celebration where they 
celebrate the originator or the uh, 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 creator god of the whole Amazon region, the culture bringer, whose name was Bebko Aroti, and he has this weird staff with which he was able to destroy trees and frighten the people. And what's really interesting is that the first day that he arrived, he was just, you know, sort of walking around and the people were very frightened. So they started to taunt him and they shot arrows at him and they tried to fight him. But whatever suit he was wearing, you know, it was indestructible. And so in order to frighten them, he used his uh, magic staff and he shot a tree, exploded, went up in flames, and you know, it befuddled the entire you know, uh, uh, native um, population there. And uh, so it took them a few days for them to come back out of their huts and uh, you know, understand that he's, he still is friendly. But what's interesting is that in the first couple of weeks, and they're very specific about their mythology or this, about this story, the first couple of weeks, he did not talk to them at all. He was just laughing with them, and when they were dancing, he was dancing with them, and he was always laughing. Very jovial kind of guy. But in the third week, he all of a sudden spoke their language. And, uh, and um, he started to create a school and started to teach them about where he came from. He drew them a map to show a star system that has been confirmed today. And the question is, well, what was going on here? Well, any ethnologist that encounters a tribe somewhere in the jungle, there's no way we can communicate with them right away. It will take us at least three weeks to even rudimentarily start to communicate with them. So to say, I mean, one of the biggest arguments was always, well, how come these ancient astronauts, they spoke English? Or they spoke so-and-so, and they spoke so-and-so, and they you know, you know, turn on your brain. Any ethnologist does it today. We go somewhere in the jungle and, and we encounter, or anywhere. I mean, how many of you have gone you know, to a different country to learn a different language? Or have done the, the Berlitz or the Pimsleur course Wow, did I just violate some uh, you know, internet advertising thing? <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway. So, so that's exactly what happened a long, long time ago. Now, moving on, oh, so, so here you have another example of you know, what these things might have looked like comparison to today. Uh, we are going to Palenque, and I'm gonna speed this up a little bit. So I'm just going to show you that underneath this pyramid, which has been built afterwards, there is a tomb. It's a tomb of Pakal, and in there, they actually found this slab. And mainstream archaeologist says, oh, this is nothing else but Pakal as he is being swallowed by the underground monster. And out of his chest grows a tree of uh, the, the tree of the cross of life. And this here, you know is the, the tail of a rattler, and all sorts of bizarre, bizarre stuff. Now, to me, this guy sits in substance of a capsule, manipulating some controls. There's some thing coming up you know, in front of his nose. Down here you have some sort of an exhaust. His foot rests on a pedal, and he's looking through some sort of a device. I am not saying that extraterrestrials built this. I'm saying humans carved this because they, they saw something that freaked them out so much, or not freaked them out necessarily, but was, what was so significant to them that they took the time and effort to rebuild or recreate something for future generations to see. And you know the whole idea about you know the cross of life. What what, what is what is a cross of life? I mean, what is what is the origin behind the cross of life? Well, any mainstream archaeologist will tell you that the origin of the cross of life has something to do with the gods. 
So we're back to square one. And therefore, we always have to ask the question, well, who were these gods? What the heck are our ancients talking about? And, you know, many times I'm told, oh, you know, you know, you're looking at this from a wrong perspective. You've got to look at it from, from this end. And I say, okay. And see, in the ancient astronaut theory, the great thing is that we're never confined by just one field of study. Our field of study can go in every direction. We can look at different cultures, different time periods, and different myths. And when I see the Palenque slab vertically like this, then I look at this part right here, that sort of bell shape. And I go on the other side of the world, and we are in Indonesia, Borobudur, and you have these stupas. A stupa is, according to Hindu mythology, a chariot of the gods, or a vehicle with which to, to reach the realm of the gods. And since the ancient astronaut theory attempts to you know, emphasize the technological nature of all these ancient stories, it's a an idea what these stupas might have achieved. They were the vehicles with which the gods arrived and with which the gods left. Now, inside each stupa is a Buddha. I am not saying that the Buddha was an extraterrestrial. I am not saying that Jesus was an extraterrestrial. They were not. So, this is just, you know, human artists trying to make sense of something that they saw. So again, Buddha sitting inside these stupas, or vimanas. Stupa is another word for a vimana, or vimana is another word for stupa. And as we've established earlier on, it's a vehicle with which to reach the realm of the gods. It's manipulating some controls again. And, uh, you know, so you have basically the whole outline and the question is, you know, could it be that our ancestors saw something like this? They tried to make sense of it. So my question to you is, what did our ancestors see? What does the, the Old Testament in the Bible describe? Is it really God? No. I think I'll do it. Now, where it was described in the Old Testament, for example, was an extraterrestrial that our ancestors misinterpreted as God. Now, I want to go on record to say that I am a deep believer in God, but my idea of God is not what is described in the Old Testament, for example, or, you know, the Western idea of God. So. I don't believe in aliens. I do not worship them. No one should. Has nothing to do with belief. This is just, you know, a great research topic to follow. But it opens your eyes. Because what it basically explains is that the ancient astronauts were the creators or the root cause for all of today's organized religions. And we have to look beyond what it really means to be spiritual. And that all the tools in order to have a connection with the universe are all in here. It's not in a book. It's not in a church. It's not in a temple. It's right here. I mean, right now, I'm in church. This is awesome. All your energy, you know, the love, the vibration. This is what it's all about. Not, you know, and then, you know, you go to church and the moment you walk out, you see what he was wearing? How could he do that? No, I mean, you know, so. Um, thank you very much. I mean, this was a fast, quick intro. The general environment you can support very small population. Yes. These massive constructions were made, obviously, by local populations. So how did they get fed? Who was the support team? Where, where was all that? Well, yeah, it's a great question. Thank you. Um, the question was, you know, how, how were the ancient, the, our ancestors fed? Because they obviously were in great numbers and they had to build all this stuff. 
And um, the answer to that is, uh, you know, number one, it took much longer than what we're told today over many generations. And number two, you know, the, the classic ancient astronaut theory does not uh, postulate that the pyramids of Giza, for example, were built by aliens. In fact, even the ancient texts, we can read how the pyramids were built. And it says that the pyramids were built by human hands, but with the assistance of the gods. So there is a, an idea that maybe, you know, in the, see, that's, that's a long, long answer, and I'll talk to you afterwards, but the thing is that there is evidence that food processing machines did exist in, uh, in ancient times. So, may I answer a few of the web questions? Yeah, here's a good one. Any ancient astronaut dis discoveries in China? Of course. In fact, one of the earlier uh, slides showed uh, these frescoes and paintings of, uh, you know, flying chariots. And uh, the, the, the quick answer to that is that ancient Chinese mythology is filled with fire-spearing dragons. Now, looking at that from a modern-day perspective, were, were they really dragons, or were they misinterpreted, you know, biological creatures, but they were uh, actual, you know, machines with which the gods arrived? And by the way, same thing goes with the Thunderbird in Native American uh, legends. That the Thunderbird, out of which the Kachinas emerged, that the Thunderbird wasn't a, an actual bird bird, biological bird, but it was some type of a flying machine that has been misinterpreted as something divine or spiritual in nature. Another question from the web. I gotta, you know, the web audience. Let's There's give him a hand, actually. Come on. If you're watching from anywhere in the world, I mean, it's science fiction. Do you okay. think? Uh, do you think any DNA has been left behind of aliens by any in any of these tombs or any of these other uh, sites? Okay. The question is whether or not any DNA has been left over by these aliens. And the answer is yes, and that DNA is not in any tomb, it's not in any, uh, uh, you know, sort of artifact, it's uh, right inside of us. We are their offspring, we are the children of the gods. You know, the question that I get asked by the critics is always, well, you know, the, the aliens, they could never look like us, I mean... <laughs> But how is that even possible? Well, it's very possible because according to the ancient texts, we were created in their image and not the other way around. So the question we should ask is not, what do the, do the aliens look like us? But do we look like the aliens? Because, you know, it's, it's clear. I mean, the thing is that you can't have a functioning intelligent being with eyes where the feet are. You can't have a, an intelligent being without some type of hands or tentacles with which to push buttons or grab something. I mean, from an evolutionary perspective, it's impossible, you know, unless, you know, a blob has such uh, mental capacities that, you know, buttons are no longer necessary. But see, all this stuff is too far out there. I'd like to talk about stuff that I can relate to. I can relate to technology, I can relate to logic, something that I'm familiar with. Even though I look at it from a, you know, modern day, outside the box perspective. But it's about time that we, you know, connect the past with the future.